Hello there, welcome back to another week of videos. Uh, this week I've got two John Boormans, two Women Freakins and a Two Idiots video. The Two Idiots video will come tomorrow and the, the Boormans will be split up. Today I'm going to do Point Blank and Tuesday I'm going to do Excalibur. Then there's going to be a double bill of freaking films. So, uh, yeah, you get a f you get films by the directors of Exorcist 1 and 2. This one, that's not bad. Eh? So I'm going to start with Point Blank. Now, Point Blank is a John Boorman film from the late 60s. It was made to MGM and starred Lee Marvin. And the funny thing about this film was it was everything the studio did not want to have. I mean, this was getting made at the same time as 2001 Space Odyssey at the same studio. And it's like, um, this, I don't know how both those films get through this studio, but both of them did. Um, the Point Blank was meant to be a normal thriller. It was meant to be just a Lee Marvin shoot em up revenge thriller. That's all it was ever meant to be. Uh, they gave it to John Boorman. Uh, Lee Marvin ended up trusting John Boorman and gave John Boorman carte blanche to whatever he wanted. And... John Boorman made tons of revenge thriller into something more arty, something about violence and how violence affects you, something more dreamlike. The only condition Lee Marvin actually had for the film was uh, for the original script, because he hated the original script, he didn't want to do that. Um, neither did neither John Boorman, so both of them hated the original script, they did their own thing. And what they did was take this novel by Richard Stark, all about the, this character who's Who's, who's gone through a lot of stories. I mean, uh, there's been lots of adaptations. Like Payback, Mel Gibson one, is just basically a remake of Point Blank. There's other stories um, called Parker. There's one called Parker with Jason Statham. Because the original character is called Parker, and they changed it to Walker. And uh, they kept it to be a Walker in this film. There's been lots of versions of it. Uh, the outfit with Robert Duvall was another version, another story with a character from one of the other novels. Um, none of them had to do with Point Blank. None of them was good as Point Blank. Well, the outfit is good. And the director's original, original director's cut of Payback is not bad either. Not the released version. You get in the discs of uh, Payback, you get two different versions. And the original version, when they refused to release it, is much better than the released version. Um, way more interesting. Parker's okay, but not great. But Point Blank's a masterpiece. Point Blank is just John Boorman at his peak. He's just uh, he's, he's just ready to do a do a, a brilliant, bizarre, weird film. He came up with the British film industry. He'd done one or two films, but he hadn't. It wasn't really established. He hadn't really done anything that was going to uh, really make people sort of sit up and notice. It was. He was a good director, but he hadn't really delivered yet. This was the film he delivered on. And what he did really was to take this revenge thriller and make it um, the idea of what is revenge? What does it do for, to you? And what does violence do to you? What is the need for violence, the need for social uh, interaction, the need for uh, social mobility do to your soul? Uh, what is engaging in violence? How do you stop engaging in violence, how is that possible? And it can cover so much but using a very simple structure of a revenge thriller. Because instead of just going for the shoot 'em ups and the the thrills and just exploiting violence to be something that would be fun for the audience, it actually questions the violence, it questions the character, what he's doing, why he's doing it. Is it a dream? Is it not a dream? Because the first moments of the film, we see Lee Marvin with um, dark brown hair get shot in Alcatraz as they attack a, a drop-off. Now, the reason I'm doing that is, is uh, Lee Marvin's old friend Mal needs to get back him with the outfit because of the corporation or whatever. Because he's in the outs because he did something wrong, he made a mistake. He lost a lot of money and now he's uh, so non grat. He needs to bring money back in to cover his mistake. So what he does is he decides to rob this transport and he tells Lee Marvin who he knows was a person of violence to come and help him and they will... That's a dual reunion because they've known each other for so long. To just trust me, it will take this money. You need your money, you and your wife can uh, go away after that. I can deal with what I need to deal with and we'll both be fine. 
trouble is when they get there and they get the money, uh, Mal shoots the people rather than just injuring them. And it turns out there's not enough money to cover his debt if he splits it with Lee Marvin. So he shoots Lee Marvin and pretty much takes the money and covers his debt. Now at this point, Lee Marvin could either be dead or he's a supernatural being, almost supernatural being of violence and anger who rose from a horrible wound, swam across the uh, river back into San Francisco, then went to LA and is now months later coming back for revenge. It could be either one because Burman never is specific enough either to make it make you real make you think it is a draw a dream or it is all reality. It places it as reality for a certain amount, but every so often it puts some doubt into your mind. And it's not just a gimmick as a dream or not. The gimmick the thing is is this a dream of revenge? And if it's a dream of revenge, what does the dream mean? What does it actually mean to the person? Why do they need this? What's the problem? What's the sickness in them that needs revenge for something? Because it's never going to get made right. This betrayal of his friend will never be made right. The idea that his wife may have gone with his friend to betray him is never something that's never going to be made right. And even when he goes through this narrative, it always goes wrong for all the people involved. Everybody's going to get damaged by this need for violence, for this need for revenge. No one's going to get what they want out of it because life's not like that if it's reality. And if it's a dream, it's a subconscious telling them that this can't work out properly. But he actually, because he's a professional, he works through the system as a blunt instrument destroying the outfit step by step. Because he knows what he's doing and he's been given pointers by Keenan Wynn, who you never know who he is till the end. And he's giving pointers to different people in the organisation who are, um, who know something. So he, t he first tells uh, Lee Marvin where his wife's now living. So Lee Marvin goes back to find his wife. His wife's now almost a shadow of her former self. She's haunted by what she did to Lee Marvin. She's, um, she's barely surviving. She's just depressed, she mal left her. It's like everybody involved almost like got away from each other to avoid thinking what they did. And she and it's a brilliant sequence where you see it Lee Marvin walking towards the camera as he's walking through LA airport to get his wife, then intercuts with him, her in her house and him going to the house and the, when they finish the confrontation she's only does all the talking and he's just sitting there listening not reacting as he is um, just trying to work it, uh, work it all out. Sometimes there's no words to say what he wants to say. The violence and the feelings is so deep in him that he can't actually express it. And that's what comes through the film all the way through. It's like, it may seem like someone who's not expressed himself much, but every time he does express himself, he looks confused and unsure and almost like a boy. Just childlike. He's just like, it, like the wounds are so deep he doesn't quite know how to be outside of this rage machine that is going to get his money back and the whole point is what's he going to do with the money when he gets it back he stole it, it wasn't his money in the first place but he stole it and he wants it back and it's, a, it's out, of, out of a bit of futility because he has no life everything that made his life worth living which is his wife you know the family she had it's all gone by his actions and by the actions of Mal. It's like it's all been destroyed. So he's just he's just as wreckage, and he seems to understand that on some basic level. But Lee Marvin plays it as someone who he understands it, but he can't quite express it. And it's in there, and his performance all the way through is like this sort it's, uh, it's always a rage against the way life's gone to him and the way he's been damaged by life. It's the way. Life can utterly destroy you, and that's what the the film is really about. Is like um, it's not just as a dream, as it not. It's almost like um, how your dreams are perverted, and how your responses to it become perverted, and how you can't quite get even. And it's like how do you actually find a balance in yourself? So as he goes through these things, and there's other terrific sequences. Like there's, a, there's a sequence where he scares this. Um, middleman for the mob who 
who works as a car salesman, but he's really the front for some mob activities. He ends up going to a car with him and destroying the car. And that's the, the, the violence that terrifies this guy. And there's other fight scenes which are really brutal because it's a bit, people get injured and beaten up and leave Marvin getting beaten up. And it's like, it's not like a super stylized fight. It's just them clubbing each other and brutalizing each other. And it's, it's never, there's never any beauty to it. It's just like, this is, this is violence. Violence is horrible. And even when Lee Marvin uses his, his uh, wits to get somewhere, it's almost like fate always is going to twist it. And the only way he can get to Mal is to make his sister-in-law, who hates Mal for other reasons, compromise herself so that he can get in to the building and get Mal. And, but Mal doesn't act like he should, he ends up dead. And it's just this mess of emotions and situations where instead of getting a clue where to go next everything becomes a mess and he's ruined the relationship we had with his sister-in-law for, for a bit and he's just left there without any sense of reason and even as he goes further and he's given more clues by the person after the mob it now becomes much more suspicious that this guy's up for his own, good, his, his own reasons for this and it might not be lawful but Lee Marvin's going to keep on going because he needs to get revenge and he will do whatever he wants to get this money this seventy thousand dollars and there's no money everyone uses cards now in the organization they don't have money so it's like uh the whole world he's fighting against is completely different from his like working class roots his way of doing things which is steal money from a bank or to steal, steal a payroll or something and this is a much higher level of organization so the whole film is about uh, trying to find a way to survive in a modern world that's completely alien to you. Try to deal with people who feel completely alien to you. Try to connect with people who you have feelings for, but you you can't quite find a way to say it right to them. And um, even the most basic expressions of romance is something you end up destroying because you're inherent violence and inherent rage. The way life's gone. So the whole movie is about violence, about rage, about destruction, the need for destruction. And the fact is, it doesn't give you any glib ways around it. It's just like that's a fact of life, that's a fact of this character. He's just trapped in violence and he, he has no way out. The only way out for him is at the end when he realises this need for the money is a waste of time. And he seems to disappear into the darkness. After all the all the damage has been done without his money and it's like, oh well, it's almost like what's the point? And that's the problem he's got, what's the point? Where where is he gonna go from here? It's just an amazing film. It's one of my favourite Boomer films. It's always been one of my favourite Boomer films. It's just like um when you first see it, you're really into it, you're not, and um it, it, it's it's deep so you can keep looking at it and finding more at within it. Because I mean the first time you see it just the the idea of it is it a dream, is it not? And then as you go further, you find a lot more nuances to it. Lee Marvin is amazing in this film. It shows you what you can do with not doing much, but inhabit a character and knowing what the character is and knowing what a little movement of your head will do and what will tell you and how it will interact with the, what the director's doing and what the story's doing. John Boomer's direction is amazing. Boomer can be all over the place as a director. I mean, he's done masterpieces, he's done disasters. But he really goes for it. Whenever he does a film, he really goes for it. So, you know, you never know what's going what's to happen because he's all into his films. He really puts his heart and soul into the films. And sometimes it's it hasn't been thought out properly. And sometimes it's perfect. It just depends. He just he just shoots for the moon and tries his best. And that's the kind of artist I like and the director. That's what I really like to see in the director. So you, you get disasters like Exodus 2, but you also get amazing films like this, or Excalibur, or Deliverance. So it's worth it. It's worth the disasters for the works of genius that are there as well. Because I mean, the genius is what survives. You know, the failures, people they fall away. The works of genius survive. He's one of those directors who, on the right day, can deliver genius. So Point Blank's amazing. I, I urge you to go and watch it. It's so good. It's so stunningly good. It's a masterpiece. It's a total masterpiece. And it's definitely one of my like top
top 20, top 30 films of all time. It's just so good. And so in a couple of days I'll be covering another film of Boomers, which is in my top 20 to top 30 of all time as well. He's got two. The other films I'll cover with Boomin, they're not as high as that, but they're also very, very good. They're also masterpieces. But there's, these two are the, the real thing. Okay, I'll see you later. Enjoy. I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye for now.